Education uh, and Urban. Thanks. And Keiko? Hi, Keiko Konoeda. I teach Japanese language courses in the program in Asian Studies. Great. Thanks, everyone. And so I invite you to stay unmuted since we are such a small group and just pause me, ask questions. Um, oh, hi, Laura. We're just getting started. We've done very quick introductions. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Uh, so I'm Laura. Nice to see people here that I've been seeing. I'm in French and Francophone studies and yeah, teaching uh, W2 in uh, Module A. Great, thanks. Um, and so this is being recorded um, and I'm inviting folks to chime in either through the chat or just by chiming in since we're such a nice small group. I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. I have some slides prepared for us. And then I have a few interactive activities and I will share links in the chat to get you to those activities. So our topic today is designing formal writing assignments for intensive classes. And as we think about this, I want us to think about assignment design from the perspective of the difference between formal garden design and permaculture garden design. And I want us to consider the question of how we design formal writing assignments in ways that acknowledge changing aesthetics, changing resources, and changing worldviews. And there are many, many right answers to the question I am about to propose. Um, so please feel comfortable answering how you feel. But I'd like us to talk for just a minute about our response to these two pictures of gardens. I like the second one, the one what on the you, right. The one under permaculture garden. Yeah, can we unpack that a little bit? What do you like about it? It's organic, it makes you want to explore. Um, it looks lived in. It looks, uh, it, it shows, it shows the passage of time, I guess. It's, um, um, yeah, that's all great. Um, other reactions to these pictures? preferences, observations. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Marcel. Um, I would say I agree uh, with Laura that uh, the permaculture one is more appealing. Um, it just seems more genuine, um, right? And I think sort of promotes a little bit more exploration. It's less rigid, less structured. Um, it's more comfortable. Um, and more engaging and inviting um, than the formal garden that, you know, seems sterile and cold and sort of afraid to walk on the grass um, mm -hmm. in that respect. And then the permaculture one makes you want to explore and find out more. Thank you so much. I also feel the appeal of the permaculture garden and at the same time, I'm approaching this in a very specific time in physical condition. The permaculture garden looks less even for me to walk on or be more scared to go into that compared to formal garden, which seems uh, better with a cane or a wheelchair. Good point. That's a That's great observation. Super cool. And yeah, I, I, I am just drawn to the order of the formal garden, which totally just says a lot about my personality, but, um, and that there's sort of a path that's offered, but, you know, you, you can veer off into the grass, but maybe, you know, that's my privilege that I think I can, <laughs> or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm a little drawn to the the formality, though the permaculture garden looks exactly like something my husband would create mm -hmm. as a landscape <laughs> designer. 
Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> I, I like one other idea with the, I do like the, you know, 18, I'm 18th century. So I'm, I'm drawn in some ways to the formal garden, but it's also, it's a system that is imposed. Like it's, it's one's, it's a design that is, I mean, they're both designs, but um, all of the plants are, um, forced into shapes that align with the designer's vision, whereas in the permaculture garden, there is the, the design, but then each plant is just allowed to express its self. Yep, yep, all really excellent points. Um, and both gardens have paths, but the paths tell very different stories about how people should navigate those paths. And I am not here to tell you which garden to prefer, um, but I am here to make the point that back in the 18th century, the permaculture garden would have been rejected flat out as just messy and a disaster, but we live <laughs> in a world where our aesthetics are changing for many, many reasons. And I think it's useful for us to think about genre as garden and think about the genres we've inherited and how helpful they are, the structures they provide, but also the ways in which we might reshape these genres to suit our needs today. Thanks. So I'm gonna go into permaculture a little bit more trying to get my slides to work, sorry. A few of the permaculture principles that I have been practicing in relationship to writing include engaging in slow observation over time, working with the material at hand, considering what permaculturists call stacking functions, which is when one action can serve multiple functions, for example, you might have a problem with water running off a building and pooling up and making a mud puddle. And so you might put a rain barrel there. That's a pretty decorative rain barrel that will collect the water. And so you don't have a mud puddle, you have something decorative, and then you use the water in another part of the garden. Um, permaculture practitioners also ask us to look at every challenge as an opportunity for creative thinking and to follow the principles of care for earth, care for people, and fair share. And so we can keep this in the back of our minds as we think about writing, assignment, design. And if you would like some more information, particularly about how permaculture draws on what's called traditional ecological knowledge, I will share out a link with you later. Um, the prospect of engaging in slow observation over time this semester, when we have compressed classes might make you feel anxious. That is how I have been feeling quite a bit. But as I've sat myself down to really work on my daily lesson plans, what I've been reassured by is how even though it's a compressed semester, we can have daily opportunities to work together with our students in either synchronous or asynchronous ways. And then this can allow us to follow some of the other principles, I hope. So the challenge of our compressed semester is how to do this in seven and a half weeks. Um, but just looking at something like a daily practice, I think can help us see it as an opportunity for creative thinking. And as a quick overview, um, we are going to, in this workshop, go over some guidelines for designing our assignments that will help us merge the process, the approach to writing, with the product that we expect. And I hope then this is an example of stacking functions so we can think of ways to teach both writing and content at the same time. So this is what we're doing today, reviewing some best practices, considering the essential elements of our assignments and relationships to course outcomes, and then working collaboratively to revise assignments as we decide we need to. So to be prepared for this assignment, sorry, please Stephanie? find, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, for clarification, when you say work collaboratively, does that mean work collaboratively with students in the course? 
to redesign? Oh, I was thinking about us together today. Okay, just making sure. Thank you. You're welcome. But um, I like that question because it brings up another opportunity. Have you done that with your students? Um, in some respects, yes. Um, I've tried a course where I designed all of the readings and assignments for the first half. And then as part of their midterm review, they told me the topics that they wanted to read on for the second half. And so then I structured readings and assignments around those interests. Nice. That takes some comfort with uncertainty on your part. I admire that. Um, does everyone have an assignment that they're thinking of assigning to their students for the semester? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things we want to consider when we are engaging in assignment design, particularly during a pandemic and in this compressed format, is the topic of stress. Because research indicates that our ability to learn depends to a large degree on the amount of stress in our environment. And this is a physiological change in the brain that can promote and inhibit learning. And so if there's no stress at all, students aren't, writers aren't, learners aren't motivated to engage in learning. And it's really about the brain chemistry too. So it's not simply an attitude, but it's rooted in this material experience. So we want to have some things that create good stress for our students. But if there is too much stress, they can go over the edge. And in terms of writing, this means breaking down into writer's block. And so keeping that in the back of our minds as we work on assignment design, I also think can be helpful. And I like to go back to the gardening metaphor and thinking about um, soil health, right? And so what can you do to prepare the soil of the student so it's prepared for learning? the soil of the student's mind and imagination and critical and creative thinking abilities. Now we, we can get back to this question. Um, as we're thinking about what we need to do to motivate our students, we might wanna think about where they are as writers and how we might learn more about this and account for this in assignment design. And so I borrowed from a graphic that Bridget made that helps us see the writing sequence here at Bates it starts with where students have come from in terms of K-12 writing instruction, which is often this rules-based instruction where they learn things like every essay has five paragraphs, every paragraph has five to seven sentences, never use I, never start a sentence with but, because, or, et cetera, et cetera. And then they come to college, or maybe before, they realize that these rules are somewhat artificial and they've helped them write essays for standardized tests, but they're not the sort of rules that real writers use. So the transition we're working on here is from this rules-based approach that they might have learned in high school to a more rhetorical approach where they're asking good questions about audience, purpose, context, and genre expectations. And so remembering what I said about stress, we can see that moving from this rules-based approach to the rhetorical approach can, in some ways, help some students feel liberated and feel a good sense of stress, but can be overwhelming for other students. Um, one other point I'd like to make is for us to also think about the various places where students are going after Bates. And I've listed a few of the places they're going, and I guess I'll just make the observation that a lot, a lot of our writing, especially in the W2, W3 sequence, is focused on that second bullet point of graduate school. And I don't want to make the point that that is necessarily a problem, but I do want to make the point that it's important for us to consider the other types of writing that our Bates students will encounter in their futures. Um, this sense of trying to get to know our students and where they are as writers brings us back to the permaculture principle of working with the material at hand because we can't plant tomatoes in October in Maine. And so um, sometimes the dominant culture 
creates this narrative which sort of insists on these certain metrics at certain times and stages that doesn't really match the readiness of the writers. And so we can push back against that, I hope. So let's move now to think about your assignments in particular. And we can use the chat or we can just talk because there are just a couple of us. I think I would prefer that. Is that okay with everyone? Um, and we can just talk together about why you are assigning this particular assignment to your students, how it relates to your course outcomes, and what you're expecting the students will accomplish via this assignment. And I will give you a preview that my goal for this discussion is for us to listen to each other and through listening then to get some new ideas that we might use to refine our purpose for our own assignments. And would someone like to volunteer to begin? Or be willing to volunteer to begin? Uh, sure. Um, I can. Thank you. Uh, for clarification, do you want a final assignment or a smaller assignment? I'm thinking right now more of a final assignment and a little bit later in the workshop, we'll get to the smaller assignments that lead to the final assignment. Okay. Great question, thank you. Um, great, so this is for sociology of immigration um, and their final project uh, in, sh well, I'm in this workshop because I have not figured out the details <laughs> um, of how to make it formal, but ultimately they are analyzing um, immigrant stakeholder interviews um, and so the assignment is designed to sort of build on memos that they've been writing uh, throughout the semester and the last week of the course um, what they'll be doing is collectively interviewing probably about half a dozen um, immigrants folks in immigrant advocacy um, organizations and those involved in policy making. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted the final assignment to sort of be as low stress as possible, but also um, to be innovative, right? The idea at the end of it is really to kind of say, how have we assessed the needs and the wants of immigrants and how to create something better? Um, and they're gonna be doing that by drawing on their conversations with these stakeholders, uh, their readings from the course, um, and through analyzing newspaper stories from at the local level and the national level. Great. Um, so a primary question that I heard in your description is how do we assess the needs and wants of immigrants and yes. how do we do better? Yeah. Um, and so, would you say that was the primary purpose of this yes. assignment? Yes, I definitely would. Yeah. And it sounds like you're still thinking about things like what type of product they'll produce to demonstrate that they've learned that. And you want to produce, you want them to produce something that's low stakes, but also innovative. Right. Does that sound right? Yes. Great. Um, so I can see clearly how this relates to your course outcomes without pushing you <laughs> to articulate that. Um, and I'll just say what I'm, what I'm hearing and invite you to clarify or refine, but it sounds like there's a sense of some content knowledge that they're going to learn. And there are also some more attitudinal things that they're going to learn about um, in terms of learning that we need to do better. Good. Other questions or comments from Marcel right now? Uh, I, so I thought, Marcel, I heard you say something about propose, like, propose something we can do in support of immigrants. Is that separate? Like, it seems like there's a meta, like, sort of a metacognitive, like, self reflective piece, but then is there also sort of like a public? um 
proposal of some sort that will come from these interviews as well that you're um, so that is actually something that I'm leaving to students. I definitely, right, I am an academic writer and I hate to sort of draw that line in the sand, um, but just sort of uh, knowing kind of what my lane is, um, right? I am not a policy writer. I am not a grant writer. I'm not a particularly creative writer either, but I do respect and um, realize the value of that type of writing. And I want to have my students sort of write towards a direction that feels fulfilling to them in regards to um, immigration, right? So if they want to write from a policy perspective, right, there are going to be speakers in our class and readings that we're doing um, and readings that they have to find independently that will allow them to sort of write in that direction, right? Um, if students want to write from a more academic standpoint, empirically, or because um, a lot of students are doing sort of community-based work, that's also possible. As students want to write from sort of a more theoretical uh, sort of framing of it, that's also possible. So I'm leaving that avenue open. Um, I th what I was sort of on the fence about was um, them doing this as a group project or a short project. So probably a, kind of a short paper that's no more than five pages um, because 35 students' papers with the turnaround time between module A and module B, um, anything more than that is sort of not particularly, I think, useful for any, anyone, um, really. So it really is about sort of a, a culmination. And like I said, like the project is scaffolded. Um, so it will sort of give me a sense and they'll be working in groups throughout the semester. Um, so I feel as though sort of I'll have a good sense of how they can develop what they're doing. Um, I have them turning in, doing a short presentation of their projects. And so just sort of figuring out um, a short format way to do that, right? That could be in a blog format, right? Where they sort of have to address um, certain points of either like how they've used the data, how they've evaluated the data using um, particular sort of theoretical frameworks from our readings. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely sort of trying to sort of figure out the best way that will allow them to sort of communicate what they're doing, you know, in a sort of a written format. So they actually have, you know, something tangible as well. And then sort of a, a, a short presentation uh, to sort of accompany that sort of whether that's in a group form or an individual form. A lot of decisions to make. It is. <laughs> um, and I don't want to lose track of these decisions, but maybe we'll go through some more of the workshop and I've made some notes to make sure to get back to them. Um, although I invite others right now to chime in if they have some prior experience that they would like to share with Marcel about the situation she's in with um, 35 students and wanting the final project to be manageable, but also give them opportunities for individual work as well as um, to say something in a product form. Sounds like you've got like some a really good, you, you've mapped out really well how you want to scaffold all of these different parts, uh, low stakes group presentations um, and, and leading up to uh, this, um, this final paper. So I don't know that I've got much to add. Um, yeah, are you working with Bates Connect with that? No, um, I'm afraid that I have to admit my complete ignorance on Bates Connect in that respect. I, uh, I was ignorant myself and embarrassingly, uh, but um, I, it may be something that can then be, uh, 
disseminated or put on a public forum for uh, the the uh, the community in in Lewiston Auburn. Uh, so they uh, um, and I'm happy to. I, I, and I don't know if Stephanie or Bridget, if you have more to add to that, but I'm thinking of doing one of my options for a final through Bates Connect. Great, yeah. Um, so I believe the Harwood Center and Andrew Mountcastle have been working on a platform to use to collect educational materials for use K-12 and also for adult learners in the Lewiston Auburn community. And so then Bates Connect is a repository for that material. And then educators and other groups can dip in and use that material to educate other um, students of all ages oh. off campus. Okay, oh, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, um, I'll definitely look, out, uh, look into that. I think, you know, part of the final product is to sort of establish, right, a building block as well. Um, for students, uh, for a, a project that I'm that I'm working on, um, as well, um, yeah, and sort of see what happens from it. So I'm not sure if their final product would be ready mm -hmm. for a Bates Connect, but mm -hmm. it would probably be the raw materials to build something mm -hmm. uh, for that platform, perhaps. Great. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, one very small comment right now too is that you could have students do group projects after their presentations and so maybe they collaborate on a podcast or a website or a digital story or a multi-authored paper um, so that you don't have 35 of those maybe they're in groups of three or four and then they could write short individual reflections sorry there's someone at my door <laughs> Oh, my dog does the same thing. No, mine too. I was trying to meet with a professor the other day and um, for the first time ever, it's like, finally, I get a meeting with this professor. And then my dog went crazy. <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. He was forgiving. Marcel, I put a link to the Bates Connect like website in the chat. Yes, thank you so much. I'm taking a look at it. Um, sure right now yeah my under like I, I i did a little tutorial that andrew led at the beginning i think it was before COVID, and a lot of it seems sort of like middle high school facing like um information for students so i'm i'm curious to see what they do also like what where how they're leaning towards like adult education as well but it sounds like it's yeah educational materials okay this is really cool thank you yeah. yeah, I, um, I, I, I mean, like you, Marcel, I knew nothing of, uh, of Bates Connect, and, uh, I, um, I, I believe there's, yeah, they're reaching adult learners and community members. Um, so I know that for the francophone community, it's it would be a good resource and a good way for my students to um, create a more public facing and relevant uh, document. Sorry, everyone, the interesting <laughs> challenges of working at home. <laughs> I'm working to get a fence built so that I can put my dog outside more. Yeah, um, that's nice. But it sounds like you were coming up with some good ideas without me, great. And then just to finish my thought, um, I've had some good experiences with having students do these group projects and working together and then writing individual reflections where they do some self-assessment and communicate with me about what they learned and what the process of working in a group was like. Okay. So that could be a solution for you that I can talk about a little bit more offline. Definitely. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Laura, would you like to say a bit about the purpose of your assignment? Yeah, well, I'm kind of embarrassed because I, uh, I, I'm still working on a lot of the smaller ones. And my idea for the final paper, so I'm in a literature class. Um, so I, I've been thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to give them two options, one which would be a 
uh, a more, so Kirk kind of corrected me a couple of weeks ago when I was describing this. At first I said, oh, a more academic paper, as if it were less than whatever other option I was going to give. Uh, so I, 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 as I'm rethinking, I'm thinking, I want to give two options, one that is more intimate for me only, and then one that would be in a more public forum like Bates Connect. So I'm still, uh, and I emailed back, I emailed Sam Bus back, and so that is still getting worked out, but I, I was thinking the last couple of weeks in our class, we are reading a, a book, Congo Incorporated. We're going to hopefully have a speaker series and invite the author. It'll be a Zoom meeting. Um, he's Congolese, he's based in, in Belgium, and he just wrote back yesterday to confirm that the dates would be good. So I thought, it might be fun to do uh, a book review as an assignment, but um, uh, and so um, a, a book review that would they would have to include references to some of the other books that we've read. Uh, it's also a survey course, right? So from medieval to contemporary, and then it's kind of bookended with this book. Congo Incorporated. So I thought, well, maybe, so that's what I thought I could talk about here now, this book review. And perhaps that is something that is, uh, that is public on Bates Connect. I'm not sure if that would work quite well, but I'm, let's imagine it is, or I can just make it public. Uh, we, we can, create a, a class page or something. But so the book review, which would include uh, references to other books and texts that we've read, and it would be a book review of this book, Congo Incorporated. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be an audio book review. Um, so yeah, digital story, podcast type thing. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not better prepared. Perfectly prepared. That sounds great. And then I'm thinking about that in relationship to purpose. Um, like with Marcel, I'm hearing that the purpose of this assignment is for your students to demonstrate some content knowledge, mm -hmm. the books that you've read this semester, and then the particular book that they're reviewing in the context of the prior literature, exactly. as well as maybe um, some attitudinal outcomes in terms of their confidence and their ability to participate in a public discussion right. about the cultural meaning of this work. Exactly. Showing yeah. its relevance. You know, the book came out four years ago and um, so it's quite relevant um, and, and being able, and this is something that I'm really working a lot on this, in, in this class, is being able to weave their voice with other voices, whether it's ref, uh, secondary source material, other sources that we've read, citations from qu direct quotes from uh, from what they're reading. Uh, but I, I really want to see them master that, um, uh, find their voice, master their own voice. Yep, great. Um, and one another parallel that I'm hearing in your assignment as well as Marcel's is there's less of an emphasis on conventional rigid genre expectations and much more of an emphasis on the content and the audience determining the genre. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a sea change um, in what I've observed. And I'm happy to see that change. <laughs> it's probably because of all of these workshops that have been going on. <laughs> Go rating updates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One of the I things, ask, oh, go ahead, Steph. I was just going to ask for others to offer feedback to Laura. Oh, okay. Um, I love, I think that, yeah, the book review sounds so cool. Um, what circles in your field might be interested in 
a review of this text and or has it been reviewed? In oh, I'm, field in I'm sure it has been reviewed. Yeah. But I want it to be, I, and I know it's been reviewed. I mean, it's, uh, it's won literary prizes. Um, uh, I, uh, so yeah, I wouldn't want them to just lift a book review off the internet. And so I, I want it to be very clear that they're referencing other materials that we've seen throughout the, the semester. Um, cool. who, who would read it? Uh, I, I, again, I think I've, I want to make it clear that their audience would be the general public people, general public, people who are interested in the material, locals. Um, uh, I'm, we're, I'm hoping, well, and he's already agreed, there will be two meetings with him. One, uh, a smaller, just intimate with my class, and then one that will be open to the Francophone community, Lewiston, Auburn, uh, Portland, you know, there's, uh, I think there would be a, uh, uh, an audience there for him. So on the heels of that, I could see that a book review or before, maybe before, uh, the, um, the, his, his, uh, uh, speaking, uh, for the community, it might be nice to have that book review out there. Yeah. yeah some kind of like, yeah, mark even just marketing a website or something that right. talks about you know the, for the public. I mean that you could also do that sort of more um, a formal like that the public wouldn't need to know about all the course content that you're teaching, right. but certainly you want students to do that. But that could be a byproduct or something additional that a group of them works on to market his talk and and get people excited about it. And then they have to think about kind of a different audience there. Um, or Go ahead, Steph. Well, I was thinking about something that Laura said in a workshop earlier this week. I can't remember which workshop, but about using Instagram. And so the book review could be something that comes maybe at the end, but they could do smaller assignments where they push out bits about the author through Instagram to generate excitement about the. And so they're learning, they're drafting their book review, they're pushing this out on social media. And then maybe they come up with questions that they want to ask him during the visit. And then after he talks, they finalize their review. And so it really creates this real situation for them to break their writing down into a process. Right. And different aspects of the process have real meaning. Yeah. And so, uh, and one other, you know, as, as uh, when you said early on, okay, well, tell us what you're, you know, give us an example or what would you like to, to explore in this workshop? And I was like, oh my God, I haven't really looked at that. And it also occurred to me, oh, now I would have 14 students doing the same book review. I mean, it wouldn't be the same, but um so I, I think this would be a group exercise or have them in groups of three, perhaps working on this group uh, uh, book review. And, uh, and perhaps I, perhaps it might make it more relevant if, uh, if they are, if each group is focusing on one aspect or a couple of aspects so that they're, they're from the get-go, they're different book reviews or different reviews of the same book. But I yeah. like Instagram also kind of leading up to that. Yeah, they can focus on also slightly different audiences, uh -huh. right? So yeah. it could be, um, the general public, um, people who, I don't know, certain ages or levels of familiarity or um, other connections with the text. I like that. Yeah, even an academic. I mean, audience, if there's some students who want that kind of a practice, um, it could be more, they could look at some reviews, you know, some models of academic reviews. And mm -hmm. one of the things I've been reading, I've been reading this book about killing the five paragraph essay. And um, He's, he talks a lot about the, uh, and I'm going to do this, just giving students some practice with sort of lower, whatever, uh, more public 
genres of the genre you're going to teach basically like you know a book review particularly an academic book review is is formed a certain way um and if you're going to assign something like that having students go look at a review like go find some reviews for movies or um you know new york times book review versus an academic review, and they and they come to the class trying to explain to everybody in the class what a book review looks like or a review just generally like what how does how do writers who do a book review you know in the new york um times versus um you know something online like rotten tomatoes <laughs> yeah right mm -hmm. and and that, that gets them sort of just engaged in the genre in a really kind of fun way um but yet they're learning it about the conventions that they then have to write in a little later so i don't know if there's something you could work out as in your scaffolding um to have them go engage in some research about reviews yeah yeah absolutely and the the last couple of weeks we're we're looking at that book but we're also looking at a few movies and documentaries that are um connected uh thematically so it, we could be doing uh we could plug that in at that point when they're looking at um reviews for those movies definitely reviews for the books yeah great great um I'm thinking that like reviews, of course, those academic reviews that we cherish, we um, value, but also students are reading a lot of reviews on Amazon.com on all kinds of materials and making decisions. So what is review doing for us in this real world and also maybe for Francophone culture as well? How are they working? in their ecosystems. I think that might be an interesting mm -hmm. um, scaffolding as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, Keiko, would you like to describe your assignment a bit for us? Uh, sure. I'm having a hard time choosing which one because I'm doing this I'm talking about the third year Japanese, intermediate Japanese, which is sort of a course that transitions from a rule-based writing into rhetorical writing in the sense that the first semester we start from words and then we go into sentence and then going into sequences of sentences. And now finally they are considering um, resistor awareness uh, and genres and which word do you choose to more um, express what you mean and the uh, effect that you want to have on the audience? And it's, I'm having, I'm focusing mostly on two or three different levels of or topics. So starting with a self introduction and how do you present yourself? what aspects of yourself in what ways in different contexts and in that i'm looking at very informal way of self-introduction to a very formal way of self-introduction and having them write um sort of a semi-formal uh, version as the cumulative project for that but uh, in the latter half, I'm having them work on a social topic because that's also a transition that they're having about talking about the familiar into talking about the less familiar. And in that pro project or the unit, students will be having um, group-based discussion with students in Japan and I'd like to see if that spatial chat might work for this class, but uh, they'll be in a group of four or five and discussing how, which global issues they're interested in and how they impact their lives um, in the US or maybe internationally, and also from those that are based in Japan. And they will consider what kinds of action that they want to make 
and also to communicate to um, in, in the combination of English and Japanese. And they'll be doing a presentation. Um, so I think um, the cumulative project for that is more of a presentation based around a project that product that they will create. But because this course is also working on a formal writing style, or we'll ask them to produce a summary of this um, individually, I'm thinking, um, based on an aspect of what they worked on in the, in the global issue unit, uh, writing a summary in a very formal academic way of writing. So in a way, changing the register there. So, yeah, these are some of the things that I'm working on. <laughs> That's great. Um, one thing I'm observing right away is this element of the stacking function in you having them use material that they create presentations out of and um, something related to action and then the more formal academic summary. And so they have this one set of material, but they're doing different things with it. Um, Thank you. I agree. And with at this level, when they're trying to expand their vocabulary, but we do, just don't have enough time, that's all I can do. And also the organization. So it's starting with the material at hand themselves and what they're familiar with, and then moving out to a social topic where the content is less familiar, but they've already established some fluency in thinking about word choice and communication and then they're building on that with the more complex less familiar material is really nice so it's helpful for us to see these assignments together i think um backing up a little bit to the question of purpose i'm also seeing a similar dual purpose in terms of the assignments helping them convey content knowledge in terms of vocabulary um, and understanding of social issues and cultural knowledge, as well as this attitudinal knowledge of um, being able to take action and look at similarities and differences. Does that match your sense of the purpose, purposes? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, other questions or feedback for Keiko right now? Okay, the only thing I'll add is that when you talked about spatial, I think it was a Japanese, a professor of Japanese studies at Bowdoin or Colby who yep. introduced it to the group. Is that right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're in touch with those folks, but you might, I don't know if there's like a collaboration between uh, Japanese studies folks at <laughs> the different institutions, but you might reach out. Yeah, I might. Thank you. Yeah, it's very occasional, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel like this whole um, summer, I, I realized I've had more communication with my colleagues at different colleges in Maine than ever before. It's been nice. You say you're going to use a portfolio, maybe? Um, Keiko, can you, can you talk a little bit about how that fits in? You said that in the chat to Marcel. Right. I'm not sure for this course I will take a portfolio approach, but for other courses that work well. But for this, I'm having students, I'm having students write a reflect journal on a weekly basis so it won't be in the form of um, portfolio but it will still there will be something that is coherent throughout the semester that students can look back on nice thank you 
Um, we've already covered quite a bit that I was going to cover in several of the other slides. And so maybe I'll just pose a question to all of us. And I don't have the question on the slide. So I'm gonna get out of this part and just put it in the chat. Um, but the question for us to think about is after listening to colleagues, what have we learned about our assignments? I'm typing this in the chat while I'm talking. So hopefully what I type in the chat will make a little more sense. I think one of the things I've learned um, in regard to audience and genre, well, oh, it should say purpose. Part purpose. <laughs> um, I let I I I'm thinking a lot more about choice this um, semester and the balance between giving students a lot of choice. <clears throat> in the audience that, and the genre they choose to write their final project in. Because I know that for challenging new genres, that's like a level of new learning that they have to do. So if I'm also giving them new content to do in that new genre, that's gonna be like double doozy. <laughs> so, I want to think really carefully about like how much choice am I giving them either in the genre or the content and maybe leaning heavily one way or the other um, and being thoughtful about that. So I'm not giving them too much um, so they can be successful and do something really neat either with the content. And, and, and so that goes back to my outcomes. Is it more important that they're showing some knowledge of the content? Um, or that like they write it in this particular genre in a certain way and it meets these certain, you know, formatic, formulaic, you know, structures and whatnot. So anyway, I mean, the two are combined, but yes. I need to think about that carefully. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. Yeah. And we can keep thinking about what we're learning from each other. Um, and I will just quickly review. So we talked quite a bit about purpose. What is the purpose of the assignment in relationship to course outcomes and what students are demonstrating? Who is the audience? And here are some particular audiences that your students might consider. Of course, their classmates, you, campus community beyond class, a community partner, other communities outside of class, and helping them think about audience specifically can then help them make choices about genre and other things. So embedding this in the assignment, or as some of you have already said, asking them to think about this and make good choices themselves about their audience can be super helpful. Another way of thinking about audience too is one's primary audience, as well as ancillary and secondary audiences who might find this work. So breaking down the idea of audience as monolithic can be helpful for our students. Um, we've talked quite a bit about genre, so I think I'm going to really skip over that. And I want to talk a little bit more about expectations in general. And then maybe here's a breakout room to get um, folks talking to each other. And so there are sort of two sets of expectations. There are expectations in relationship to the product that students are going to deliver. I don't like to use the word submit, right? Um, and then there are expectations in regards to the process that students are gonna take to create this product. And I think um, we've talked mostly about product expectations and we've talked a little bit about process and this is where I think writing specialists can be helpful too, because we can help you think more precisely about the scaffolding and sequencing you can provide to students so that they can develop a research process and a writing process 
that will help them meet your expectations. Questions so far? And so, some of our expectations have to do with conventions. Some of them have to do with demonstrating what is at stake, engaging in a conversation in relationship to the primary literature. And this is all in the column on the left. And then what I'm proposing in the column on the right are some of the process steps that we can take to break this down for our students. And this goes back to that point I was making earlier about slow observation over time. And so if we spend some time engaging in rhetorical reading with our students, maybe we do that every day during the first week of the semester. And at the end of that week, we have an informal assignment due where they create a rubric about this genre that we then revise with them or revise ourselves and propose as a rubric for them to use when they're creating their own writing in that genre. And so we're having conversations with them. We're seeing what they're learning. The conversations can be synchronous or asynchronous. And then there's something at the end that is gonna be used later in the semester that comes out of those conversations. Um, another thing that I often hear, even um, in the thesis level, is students having a hard time demonstrating what's at stake in the research. And I think that's because we often rush past what makes a good question. And so you can have either a synchronous or asynchronous workshop with your students about what makes a good research question. Even when they're doing the rhetorical reading the prior week, you can prepare them for this by having them discuss the questions that various texts explore. So they also have, in addition to a rubric about the genre expectations, model questions that they can then use to model their own questions on later. The other process steps are process steps that I think we're a little bit more familiar with. And I, if you're comfortable, I'd like to ask the three faculty to join a breakout room, maybe just for 15 minutes, and to work together on a document about their product expectations and the process steps. Can I get like a nod or a thumbs up or something in the chat if that sounds okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop my screen share.
and back. I was afraid I would, I wasn't keeping track of time. Oh, yeah, you're fine. Okay. About a minute and a half left. I'm going to oh. give them a one minute warning. I gave a three minute warning. I'll give a one minute warning. And then nice. how do I bring them back? I don't really know how it to just do that. End, there's just, it says end, end breakout rooms and then, it, and then it gives everybody one minute. Oh, so then I'll do that. Okay, close all rooms. Oh, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so much. It's, I'm overwhelmed. Just, well, yeah. Whatever. I have no idea what I'm doing for my PALS training on Monday. Me neither. I'm, yeah. I mean, what you gave me is really helpful, and I think I'm just going to use a lot of that. Do it. But I did. Have, I did have a good chat with Amanda though, and we're. I think we're going to do time management workshop and a uh, a word document workshop. Yeah, yeah. He said, like, a lot of faculties use Word. Wow. Um, yeah. Another thing I do with my pals, not with the upper level PWSAs, that might work, though, for the PWSAs, is I ask them to remember what their pal leaders have done for them that they want to do and what their pal leaders did that wasn't effective. So your PWSAs, you know, might remember. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter's just leaving for Augusta. Love you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> so that was my first experience doing a breakout room. How did oh. it go for you all? Well. Great. Um, in the breakout room, was there anything that came up that helped you think more clearly? about your assignments and your classes? I would say for me, uh, really being explicit about the audience that students are writing to my, unfortunately, I feel like I tend to leave that as sort of a bit of an amorphous concept. And then, yeah, students who already aren't very, students who aren't very confident in their writing, I could tell that they can they get a bit lost. Um, yeah, flip that around and say, Fortunately, you're thinking about audience now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I found that very helpful. Good. Thanks. And I think for me also, just really parsing out the the steps, um, the steps in getting there. Um, yeah. So. Great. Um, we have 10 minutes left, and I would like to leave time for other questions that you have about formal writing assignment design this semester. Um, or I can invite you to use 10 minutes for something else that you need to do. <laughs> and invite you to email us if right. questions come up. Uh, I guess one of the things that I was, I've never done the student portfolio mm -hmm. sort of process, right? So I, you know, do the scaffolding and I have assignments that sort of mirror each other. Like they write about, right, issues of whatever the topic might be that interests them, right? Urban, immigration, what have you. Um, and then have them write write that again at the end of the semester and drawing from the course material, but in actually sort of constructing a portfolio that's built. I don't know, just what are the mechanics of that actually look like in assessment yeah. and tracking and those types of things? I'll gladly follow up with some resources and look for something to post in the chat now, but um, I also Great. know that others in this room have experience with it, so I will defer to them while I do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, Mar well, Keiko, you, you've done portfolios too. Um, and uh, portfolios can take a lot of different forms and processes and purposes. Yeah, so, mm, 
So I would say, uh, thank you. I'm asking this because of your suggestion. It's a 200 level course um, and one where I don't expect students to necessarily have a breadth of knowledge beforehand. Mm -hmm. There's no prerequisites. It's an introduction to the field as well. Uh, and so part of the thing, what I'm looking for is definitely intellectual growth over the course mm -hmm. of the semester and in, informed, right? Mm -hmm. um, intellectual growth. And so. Well, sometimes a portfolio is a way of assessing a long term. It's not a long term for this um, compact format, but the right. beginning of the module and end of the module and some level of um, revisiting what they wrote in the beginning is something that a portfolio allows them to do. And also um, archiving of materials that they have collected, that they reflect on. So it doesn't have to end up with one beautiful product, but you might have a few different things that you worked on and you can look at the whole thing and add a reflection to it. That's a way of looking at a portfolio as well. Um, students also choose typically the things that they want to showcase as what they have worked on as portfolio so that student agency and choice I see as some element of a portfolio as well. So in different classes I worked on, students had to sometimes choose certain number of things to, and then justify why they chose certain things. Or in some other places, I just had them use the same template and then uh, look at where you are in the beginning and where you are in the end. So it's very free form, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and and Marcel, were you um were it's I, I thought I heard you say that you really you're you'd like to see this as a way for them to reflect on their own progress. Yes. Obviously. Um yeah, and I I wonder, and, and maybe you've said this already, but uh, perhaps there's also a way for them to journal? And yes, um, right or right, sort of weekly reflections. Uh -huh. and, and I guess, is it is this sort of a platform that I could just sort of set up in Lyceum where they have individual so folders or threads? You, you can, there's definitely ways you can do this in Lyceum. Um, uh, and I know, you know, I've, I've played with that before and it's kind of where they have kind of like their own blog space and you can do that. Got you. Okay. Um, it's a little, there's quite a few hoops to jump through. And in the end, I just prefer Google Docs. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going right. to share my screen again, if that's yeah. okay. And, and I'm going to and what sorry. I've done, yeah, sorry, but what I've done with Google Docs, because I use this quite frequently with students for journaling, mm -hmm. I, I ask them to always add the most recent entry at the top. So oh. it is kind of like a blog. Um, and, and, uh, and then that's, you know, the, then at the end of the semester, they have a very long Google Doc, yeah, like this one, yeah, final reflection. Oh, what's this? So I have my students like you keep reflections and all of their assignments in a Google folder. And then at the end, they write a final reflection about their progress and areas where they still need to work. And they post links to the course texts that have influenced them. So that's what some of these links are. And then they post links to their own reflections the students quoting his reflection oh, so this is a super low-tech way but yeah. the, here he has his first draft he says it was rough then the final draft um, and then some students in the past I had them do it um, with Adobe Spark which we can't use any more I don't think but um, no. you'll see how oh, the students nice. can look at pictures and have their different revisions and have wow. screenshots of like the feedback I gave them and screenshots of their classmates feedback um, but they don't have to do Adobe Spark they could also just use like Wix and oh. then this is for across the student's whole career from FYS to other classes and so I like to give them options here because 
they're often fluent in some of these technologies. And then those who are, I'll say, I'm going to support one technology. So if you're not confident, this is what you should use. But then they might see their classmate using Wix. And I'm like, I don't know how to use Wix. And they'll be like, OK, Ruth, help me use Wix. So there's a lot of like on demand peer to peer learning. Um, but like here, this is super. And then this is also private when they use the Google Doc and super low tech. Um, and somewhere I have a template, someone was using Google Slides. And so that's almost as easy as Google Docs. And they might have a picture, a little reflection, and links for each assignment that they choose. OK. Yeah, that actually does seem um, pretty cool. I think Google Slides seems like low tech and very accessible. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that you could. I, I like that, how you can then just reference, uh, link to, they can link to other papers, or that's very nice. So no more Adobe Spark, huh? Um, the yeah, thing is, is I think they're making it a four pay service in a month. Oh. And so students won't have, that was what people in our IT department were scared of. And our IT department doesn't support it. So I've, if students use their Bates account to make an Adobe Spark, they're not always able to publish and share it. That might have changed, but I've had students build the portfolios in Adobe Spark and then have to rebuild them in a private account. Oh, yeah, but let's let's ask Michael <laughs> to support Adobe Spark. His office yeah. doesn't like it right now. I thought yeah. we had access to the whole Adobe suite. Yeah, so did I. And which includes Spark, I thought, but maybe not. Yeah. There were some permissions on the Spark that were shut down and then hmm. with negative consequences. It's so so fun. we have two minutes left. Um, I want you to Take a deep, no, I want you to remember Bridget and I are here to support you and you're here to support each other. <laughs> Any final words from anyone else? Other questions? Oh, I kind of have a question, but not really on the content or writing. So I heard there were great discussions and resources being shared on a writing focused community of practice that Laura shared and some other people shared and I would love to see Google Slides and templates and things that are shared as much as you feel comfortable. Oh sure, sure. Um, I'll see if you can get at it. David George is in charge of that group actually. Oh. <laughs> but I'll see if I can add you to the um, folder or I'll ask him to add you. Sure. It has been good, dis good discussions indeed. Very much. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I also just realized, yeah, Google Sites might also be a really easy way oh, yeah. Yeah. for them to build something. So. Yeah, I never, yeah that's, that's a good idea. I've never used it. It's so much better like now. The, yeah, it is. The it first used to be Google super slides. clunky. Yeah. yeah. It has like super limited kind of formats, so you could only play around with it um, so much. So yeah, maybe having them build something there in yeah. small groups. Yes, I had. I, oh, wait, Google. I thought you said Google Slides, but yes, Google Sites, right? Yeah, I had my, my FYSR is built using Google Slides, Sites, uh, so nice. uh, some wonderful yeah. portfolios. And I think that's like the e not having so many templates and then having easy linkable access to all your Google Docs was really um, helpful for them. Yeah, because um, I'm building one actually for the course using Google Sites. There you go. Yeah, I did the same thing. And so, yeah, pretty seamless. Yeah. All right, well, best wishes everyone. And remember we're here if other questions come up beyond the workshop. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank this was you great, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Take care. Bye for Bye. now. <laughs>